Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so I'm going to resume the previous section. We were looking at centrifuges and we're going to continue the examples today and I'm hoping that by today's class you'll be able to see how to change the operation of a centrifuge and by tomorrow's class we're going to be designing a centrifuge. So let's, um, let's get right back into where we were and I'll quickly recap. Here was a lab centrifuge we considered in the previous class. Uh, this system operates completely in a batch mode. You load your material, the liquid and the suspended solids is added and after a period of time of operation you land up with a small pellet here at the bottom and the leftover liquid is called a supernatant. So it's a completely batch operation. In the previous class I also introduced some of the concepts around the, how we describe the forces operating in a centrifuge. So the key new force that we have is our centrifugal force and the centrifugal force is given in that outward direction that the particle is experiencing. And what's important is just some concepts around unit conversions. The Hertz is a unit that means per second and 2 pi radians per second is equivalent to 1 hertz. We can also convert radians per second into revolutions per minute using that relationship over there. Okay, so omega, the SI units for omega has units of radians per second. Okay, though revolutions per minute is commonly used. But uh, there's, the, there's the relationship between them approximately. And I gave you some indication of how fast and slow various uh, rotational devices ha um, go. And the one thing I didn't really cover last time was what G is, capital G. So G is the number of, it's a dimensionless number that tells us the number of ratios against gravitational force, G, lowercase g. And it's simply R omega squared divided by G. So we line up with a dimensionless number and we're, we've heard this term before, the number of G-forces um, on a midway or a number of G-forces in a vehicle or in a washing machine are given here for reference. Okay, so we've got that as a, as a frame to work from and we're going to use that in the, in the example coming up. I then also just wanted to quickly point out for those of you that will only ever experience a lab centrifuge that this is a typical equation you'll come across. It is completely empirical. There's no science behind it. It's all um, simply derived from empirical observation. And when you're looking at this lab centrifuge, I showed you the photo of it earlier. Here's a diagram from Dr. Ghosh's textbook. Um, we're interested in two things. Either how long do we spin this for, or, um, uh, sorry, that's mainly our selection factor, is really how long do you spin it for, for a given RPM. Okay, so we select our RPM that we, and the reason why it's called RPM max is because those centrifuges warm up a little bit, they get to their final rotational speed, but you set that as the user, what you'd like the RPMs to be, and then your only other piece of information that you can adjust is how long do you centrifuge for. And so what we typically look up is, in a table, people have, have got the Svedberg coefficient for the material, so if you're separating collagen, for example, You'd look up the Svedberg coefficient there, 6.43. R min and R max are known. They're the dimensions of the particular centrifuge you have in the lab. Okay? So you'd pick up that value, substitute it in there, calculate a K value, and then once you have K value, your S value, it's telling you the, the time taken to separate that material. Yes? Um, I'm not sure. There's, there's, I, this, this is from a textbook. I'll, I'll get back to you in tomorrow's class. Yeah. Okay, so that's a lab centrifuge, but we're not going to focus too much on these. We're focusing more on larger scale centrifuges to separate out material. And I'm going to also talk about how we do that on a continuous basis. And this is the device we used. I showed a video of this last time. In fact, I'm going to quickly show that video again because I cut it short at one point at the end of the class last time, last week. The key thing I want you to take away from that video is this vertical wall of water. Okay, and to see that it's almost a, it's a circular piece around here. And then secondly, 
where the liquid flows in and where the liquid flows out. So let's take a look at this guy's video again. Um, okay, I'm just going to grab the sound. Okay, I'm just going to pause it at that point to point out two important lengths that we need to be using, R1 and R2. So this is the central point in the centrifuge. R2 is the distance from that point to the outer wall. So that outer wall here is retaining the liquid. And then R1 is the distance from the center to the inner wall, basically this inner lip, this metal lip. R1 and R2 are fixed. Once you buy the centrifuge, those radiuses are fixed. Okay, so we'll see those radiuses coming up in the next slide, but I just wanted to point it out here. And we'll just continue on with the guy adding liquid. So imagine this on a continuous basis. You've got a continual feed at the center. And then once it's filled enough, now look at where, where the liquid goes, the excess liquid. You see it's starting to spray out over the edge here. Okay, I'll post this online and you can watch the shutdown procedure. Um, but really what I'm interested in is, is that continual operation. So imagine in a continual basis you're feeding material in the center here and it's landing up there and it's immediately being thrown against the vertical wall of water at R1. So you're feeding liquid continuously. That liquid has to go somewhere. Once the centrifuge is filled up, this liquid is at capacity and what happens then is that the X the new liquid coming in displaces the liquid and the older liquid that's already been in, in the centrifuge starts to leave in the overflow over that lip. Okay? So there's always a constant volume of liquid in the centrifuge. And this is where this uh, might be a little bit confusing initially. We're feeding the liquid in continuously at some flow rate Q and that liquid is also leaving continuously at some flow rate Q. Okay. So continual liquid flow in at Q, continual liquid flow out at Q. The liquid is continuously in continuous operation. The solids, on the other hand, those particles get trapped in the centrifuge. Solid particles will be retained. They get flung against this inner wall and up against here, and they build up. And then after a period of time, say 30 minutes or so, for example, the operator will shut the centrifuge down remove the solids, and then start the centrifuge back up. So it's semi-batch operation, in fact. The liquid is operating on a continuous basis. The solids are in a batch mode. Okay. 
Now let's take a look at the particle's trajectory. Here's the net trajectory taken. It's sort of this arc shape. But let's take a look at why that is an arc. So there's two components to the velocity of a particle. There's a vertical component and a horizontal component. And both of those, we know what they are. The horizontal component is given by the centrifugal force out to the side, okay, r omega squared. And because that centrifugal force is r omega squared, if you're rotating that particle at a constant omega, so the rotational speed is constant, as the particle gets further and further to the outside, it's experiencing a greater centrifugal force. It's actually going to go faster. So the inner radius is where the particle starts at R1. By the time the particle ends up here against the wall, it's at a radius R2. So it's, it's got that parabolic shape that you're seeing over here. There's also a vertical direction to the velocity vector, vertical component. And that's simply given by the volumetric flow rate, Q, divided by the cross-sectional area. So anytime we take a volumetric flow rate, Q, that's got units of meters cubed per second. And we divide through by A, the cross-sectional area. We're going to land up with some sort of velocity type units over there. And that's telling me the vertical velocity that this particle is experiencing. And that's constant. As long as I'm feeding at a constant volumetric flow rate Q, my cross-sectional area through which that liquid goes <laughs> is constant. That, that component in the upward direction is constant. So the net trajectory are these sort of arc shape. Okay. Any confusion on that? Any questions? This is really an important point to understand because it's going to play into how, how big do we make the centrifuge is going to be our next question. Yeah. Um, so is, is what you're saying is that when, when it's rotating, the, the, the water makes the wall at like a parabola, uh, the, parabola on the side? Or? The, the water is always a perpendicular. This blue is the water shape. Oh, okay. okay. The particles that are traveling in the liquid have this <laughs> parabolic shape. The particles move in a parabolic shape. If you looked at this, this is the side view. If you looked at this from the top, you would see your center point there, and that radius is your outer radius R2. And from the top, you'd also see another piece of metal, which is radius R1. Okay. The liquid fills up this ring shape over here. Okay, so the top view, there's always this constant two circles inside each other, that area in blue over here is the area that's filled up by the liquid. And it's a vertical wall. Because we're spinning this so fast, that wall remains vertical. Yes? Is that the area that you mean when you're thinking like the... Uh, that's this cross-sectional area through so which... Like yeah. Right. We'll, we'll see the formula for that in a minute. Okay. The centrifuge is spinning so fast that we really don't have to take gravity into account. This particle that moves in this direction is only experiencing two forces of any practical magnitude. The vertical force due to the velocity of the liquid and the horizontal force due to the centrifugal force. If I take a centrifuge and I turn it sideways, that particle will still follow that same trajectory. If I turn it upside down even, it will follow the same trajectory. Okay, gravity means nothing in this problem. Gravity is such a small force relative to the other forces going on here. Okay, so that's the trajectory of the particle. And let's take a look at what that might be. So let's take a look there at that formula. That was, we saw that earlier in the sedimentation section. And there's G, the gravitational force. All we do is we take that equation, Stokes's law, and we substitute g for r omega squared and we're done that's essentially the radial force operating on that particle and we can write that as dr by dt so the change in radius over time dr by dt is the velocity in that horizontal direction or centrifugal direction is what that term on the left means same equation just substitute g for r omega squared and we get exactly what we would expect. 
if we rotate the centrifuge faster and faster, so higher omegas, that particle will move to the edge at a faster velocity. Larger diameter particles, they'll move to the edge faster. Larger density difference between the particle and the fluid will also imply faster velocities. Okay. Why is it realistic that Reynolds number is assumed less than one in this derivation? Any thoughts on that? Okay. It's a reasonable assumption because if Reynolds number was greater than one, you wouldn't be using a centrifuge. You'd probably just be using a sedimentation vessel. And we wouldn't go to all this effort and of building a centrifuge if that was if we were experiencing Reynolds number greater than one. So this is really for extremely small particles operating in very low density difference environments. Okay. Any other cases, a centrifuge would be an overkill for this. So that's a good assumption, and we can always test it, and I'll show you how. Now, if we take that equation dr by dt, so it was a function of r over there on the, in the previous slide, and we can integrate that function. We can integrate it from the inner radius r1 to the outer radius r2. Okay. And if we write that, we could write it as r1, r2 is dr by f of r. So what do I mean by f of r? f of r was that entire term there on the right-hand side, which is that everything is constant, the particle diameter, the densities, the, the, the viscosity, only r um, is changing over time, the radius of where that we find that particle. So that's the only unknown on the right-hand side. So let's integrate that function, and we're going to integrate it from time 0 to time, we'll just call it t star. Okay, and if you solve that integral, you get the equation that's up there on the slides. You can prove that to yourself at home. And it's telling me how long... Remember, so we're integrating from time zero to time t star. So how long does it take for that particle to go from R1 to R2? And that's really what we're interested in. That's should, how long is it going to take from a particle coming in at the bottom, right there at that point in the wall, and moving all the way to that top corner, R2, in the centrifuge? Okay, so it's a symmetrical device. A particle coming in here on this side would land up there at R1 and travel to that point, R2. So this is happening all around the centrifuge. I'll just show one particular cross-section. And that's the time taken, T star. And once we know T star, we can also calculate the volumetric flow rates through the centrifuge. I'll come to that in a minute. But let's, we're going to make a bit of a crude assumption here. So let's pay attention to this. This is, uh, I'm going to just illustrate it with a laser pointer over here. So we were assuming our particle follows this trajectory from that point and lands up at that corner. What we, what we can also assume is that particles that, don't, that follow a, tra a different trajectory will land up in a different place. So let me talk about it this way. Which, how will the trajectory look for a particle of a smaller diameter than the one I've shown here? So here's a particular diameter particle. Is that trajectory for a smaller particle going to be over here to the left, the same trajectory, or over there to the right? To the right, to the right okay. So smaller particles will follow a trajectory that, if I draw it with my laser pointer, it would look something like that. They'd land up over there, for example. What we're going to assume is that any particle that has that sort of trajectory that doesn't make it to this corner but lands up somewhere along that surface, we're going to assume that particle gets sucked out in the supernatant and flows out <coughs> with the liquid so it is not retained. Okay. A larger particle diameter than the one shown here is going to have a trajectory where it lands up against the wall. Okay, and then it's stuck over there. 
So we don't really care about larger particles than the one, our reference diameter. So this is my reference particle. Larger particle diameters will get trapped against the wall and they're retained in the centrifuge. It's only particles of smaller diameter. So we always design for the smallest diameter case. We, we're really not concerned about diameters that are larger than that. Okay, now that is a little bit of an unrealistic assumption, of course, about that particle. And I'll, we'll, we'll loosen it up in a, in, a, in a slide or two from now. But let's just continue with that thought that we have T star is the time taken for that trajectory of that particle. Okay, so now the question is, what throughput can we use in the centrifuge? So when we use the term throughput, I'm referring to Q. So throughput equals Q, and it has units of volumetric flow. How fast can I push my feed in the centrifuge to leave? Because if we think of it, if we look back at this trajectory, if this particle is currently going along the trajectory and landing up exactly at that corner there, what happens if I double my volumetric flow rate through the centrifuge? Is that trajectory going to change? Right, so if I increase Q, the upward velocity is greater. That particle won't reach that particular point. It will reach a point somewhere along this face over there. Okay, so Q is very much another decision factor in our centrifuge. How fast do I feed the material? And you always have that under your control as the engineer. Okay. For a given centrifuge that your company happens to have, you can pick Q. So we want to know what that Q might be. And we can calculate Q in this way. Given T star, that time taken to separate, just separate out a particle, V is the volume in the centrifuge of the liquid. So the volume of the liquid in the centrifuge is V. And that's given by a formula that looks very familiar to you, pi times the difference in the radius squared times the height, H. So just uh, to emphasize what that means is if I've got my two walls of water over there, this distance there is R1, and this distance from the center of my centrifuge is R2. And then this distance from the bottom of my centrifuge to the top of my centrifuge is height H. So I've got water retained in that wall and water retained in that wall. If you take the complete circle of water, that, vo that is the volume of that liquid. H is the height in your centrifuge, R1 and R2 are the two radii. Okay, so V is that volume, that's the term that appears over there, pi R2 squared minus R1 squared H. That's the V term. The rest of this is exactly just T star but inverted. Okay, and that's, that's really what we designed for. We always know as the engineers what our Q is. We're told we need to treat so many meters cubed of material per unit time, so we know Q. We can buy a centrifuge to have a velocity V based on that calculation T star. Now, this is really an overkill design because you can be quite sure that a particle that follows this trajectory that I'm going to show you now with my laser pointer. So starting over there, a particle following this trajectory up and landing at this point will likely also be retained. Does that make sense? Yeah, Because that horizontal lip there you saw in the, in the prior video with the guy throwing in the green liquid, that horizontal lip is metal and it's going to retain a particle that lands up at that point just as well as the particle that's land up there in the corner. So we recognize that designing for a particle to land up in the corner is excessive. So what we say is, well, let's design for a particle that lands up midway between R1 and R2. So don't, don't necessarily have it land up at R2. 
we don't need it to land up over here, we'll be quite happy if the particle follows a trajectory so that it lands up over there. Okay. So now our assumption is particles that land up from that point and onwards, they are retained and particles that land up from that point and over to the left, those go out into the supernator. So it's a less excessive design. And if we follow the same integration, now instead of stars, I'm going to use the word cut. So T cut is my cut point time and Q cut is my cut point volumetric flow rate. All that happens is now my integral is from slightly different points. Uh, from R1 to a different final radius, and so my denominator is modified slightly over there. That's the only difference if you compare the two equations um, side by side. It's, there's log R2 over R1, and this is the log of a slightly different term. But that's really all that's changed, and it leads to a less excessive design. Okay, so let's take a look at this quickly from an intuitive point. If you want to treat a given amount of liquid, Q cut, and your boss says, I need you to treat more, 20% more liquid, what can you change in that centrifuge? So that you still get the same level of separation. What's the most intuitive thing you'd go and change? Increase the RPMs. Increase the RPMs. Okay, what does that equation show up? that will happen. Omega goes, up. Omega goes up, so Q cut goes up. Okay? Everything else is fixed. You're still treating the same waste stream with the same particle size, same densities, same viscosities, and the radius R1 and R2 of the centrifuge don't change. It's the same centrifuge, and the height doesn't change either. So only omega is changing in that <laughs> equation when you increase the speed of the centrifuge, indicating that you can go to higher throughput rates. Okay. If you're already spinning that centrifuge at the maximum RPM, so omega star can, omega cannot go any higher, then you're stuck having to purchase a second centrifuge. Right? Or moving to maybe a different liquid phase, rho f. But usually rho f and rho <laughs> p are fixed. But this equation is, is, is telling us exactly what we know from an intuitive perspective. Yeah? So let's, um, let's try this out then with a, with a problem. I'm going to have you consider this lab centrifuge. And the equations are messy and the calculations are messy and we don't need to do that here in class. But what you'll do is let's use the, again that strategy because this problem has a few a few uh, details that are important to consider, but let's use our strategy where we define our problem. We explore plan, do, and check. So what is it that we're aiming to do here? So remember the define stage has several sub-steps. So what's our aim? What, are, what do we know? What don't we know? The explore stage that I'm going to let you do for a few minutes here is uh, which equations apply? And which assumptions are we making? And are they valid? Okay, and then the plan step is how are you going to tackle those calculations? So the first question, let's, uh, let's Define, explore in general, but then plan your strategy for the first three questions. Don't worry about question four. Let's take a look at this. Um, if you've had a chance, um, you've likely just had an uh, opportunity to look at the define and perhaps the explore stage. Um, I'll work with you through the plan stage if you're not there yet. The aim, of course, is uh, given here fairly directly. Our aim is several sub-steps. Calculating capital G, calculating Q star and Q cut. Okay. I'll come to a separate plan and a description about uh, whether Stokes law applies after this. So our aim is then G, Q star and Q cut. 
We know all the things that are given there expressly. We don't need to repeat that again. R1, R2, H, omega is given, rho F, rho P, all of those details. Anything that we don't know? Omega is given in units that are not the units we should be using. Okay, so that's correct. The only um, unknown is omega, and you can show to yourself that that's 5026 radians per second. Okay, so just follow that unit conversion there. Now, when we look at the explore step, the explore step asks whether <coughs> which equations apply and which assumptions are being made here. So in the explore step, which I'm going to look at over here, which equations apply? Well, again, as I've said in a prior class, it's a little bit artificial when I do this in a classroom because it's obvious the prior equation we've just discussed is what applies. Um, so it would be something along the lines of Q star equals V over T star, or Q cut is equal to V divided by T cut, and in the case of G, our equation is G is R omega squared over G. Okay, so those would be the tools we'd be using for solving this problem, but we should also check the assumptions behind them. The assumptions are, of course, that this is for a particle of dp. So we need to check whether we're using the appropriate dp. And then secondly, it assumes Stokes' law applies. Okay, and that is another way of saying the Reynolds number is less than 1. Now, we're going to check that Stokes' law applies later on. That's coming up in an exam or test or in practice, obviously, this is not explicitly given to you, so you would simply verify that yourself anyway, right? If you're assuming it here in the explore step and in your, when you're planning and doing the problem, you better well check it afterwards, okay? We never make assumptions uh, without validating them where possible, and this is an easy assumption to validate. Certain assumptions we simply have to make because they simplify the problem and are, we're unable to verify them, but this is an easy one to check, and we will uh, do so later on. The other point in the explore step is that this is for a particle of dp. We're told that our smallest particle is 0.7 micrometers. Okay? Is that a valid diameter to be using? Should I be using a different diameter? Okay, and as said before, this is the, the correct diameter to be using because we've, we've likely, and we will have in practice, a particle size distribution. So if we've got a distribution of particles in a, on my diameter scale micrometers, we're designing for this particle. We don't design for the average. We don't design for the maximum particle size. We design for the minimum. If the minimum particle can get separated, everything else will also be separated. Okay, so that's a valid assumption to be making. So for a particle of dp, min is what we need to be doing. Yes, Sean? Can we check Stokes' law? Can we use the velocity of dp cut? Yeah, we'll get to that when we come to question three. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Then. Okay. So let's take a look at how we might plan this. Well, the planning and the doing are really uh, so easy in this problem that we might as well uh, do them simultaneously. So the plan then for number one is simply to there's no problem combining the planning and the doing step in one, in one go, and most of you do this anyway. You're planning in your head and you write down on paper. So in part one, our plan is that G is R omega squared over G. And when you sub in the values over there, you can do so quite easily and check for yourself that that's 57164. Okay. Now, 
I'm also going to just on the side here do the check step. So we've got plan, do, and check. Is that a reasonable number? You guys have no exper prior experience with capital G. Does that number look right or isn't it right? Seems quite high. Do we have anything to go on? No? Yeah? If we look back in our notes, we're told what typical ranges are. Right? So let's at least check against that table that we had on our earlier slide, <laughs> slide 9. We're seeing there that lab centrifuges have revolutions per minute in that range and have Gs between 100,000 and 800,000. Okay, so this is maybe a little bit on the lower end. It might be a bit surprising to you. But let's, let's put this in perspective. Did you actually think about how big the centrifuge is? Visually, how big is the centrifuge? Go look back at the problem. It's not just a sequence of numbers. They actually have meaning. Right, that centrifuge is no taller than the, the visible part of the ruler that you're seeing now. So it's a small centrifuge, very small height. And R1 and R2, that would be the diameter of the centrifuge. Okay, so this is a really small lab scale centrifuge. We're not expecting a whole lot from this guy. So that might be a reasonable value to be using. Okay, so don't look at these problems just as numbers and equations that you can substitute in and solve. Let's, let's think about whether these are realistic. And that's what that check step does. Is it, that's where the engineering happens, right? This step is you're, you're nothing more than a sophisticated spreadsheet when you're doing. You're plugging in and calculating. That's really anyone can do that. But this is what engineers do. They define, they explore, plan, and they check. The doing I can give to anyone to to do. So the check over there seems reasonable. Let's try Q star and Q cut, the plan and the do step for that. So Q star is equal to a fairly straightforward equation. You've got it there in the slides. I, again, don't spend time in my classes ever, as most of you who've had me in prior classes know that we don't substitute in and calculate numbers a lot. But I do expect you to verify this at home that that's 5.54 times 10 to the minus 6 meters cubed per second. Okay, And let's work in numbers that we can check. We can't really check numbers that look like this. We're, we don't have a daily reference from this perspective. But our daily reference can be easily done if we see that as 20 liters per hour. So think back again to that small centrifuge. It's a device that's probably no bigger than this. You're putting 20 liters through it every hour. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, OK. What does your coffee filter do at home when you're making a cup, like the big filter that you pour six, seven cups of water through it? How long does that leaching process take? Right? You can calculate typical flow rates of that and use that as a guide or see it as jugs of water that you're drinking every day, right? So you can, it's very easy to get an idea of whether that's reasonable or not from your everyday experience. 20 liters per hour seems quite reasonable. What's interesting then is if we compare Q cut, now before we even do any calculations, should that be higher or lower? Based on what we've just learned a few minutes ago. Check back to your notes. Do you expect Q cut to be a higher value or a lower value than Q star? I'll give you a minute. Just flip back, check your notes, check your understanding. Brandon? Because <coughs> the amount of throughput, yeah. Okay. 
Anyone got a sense? Other suggestions? Higher values or lower values? Right, so Q star is the time taken for this particle to go as shown here in the black curve. And Q cut is the volumetric flow rate if we would like the particle to go from that same point starting over there but landing up at the center point. Okay, so if you like that to happen, it, it means that you can operate at higher flow rates, higher volumetric throughputs. So Q star should be a lower value than Q cut. Okay, and if we calculate those numbers, we do get that confirmed, in fact. Q cut is 1.19 times 10 to the minus 5 meters cubed per second. And that corresponds roughly to about 42.8 liters per hour. So there's my check built in right there. That question inevitably asks you to check it yourself. Q star is lower than Q cut. That makes sense. We expected that, or we should expect that. OK, so always verify that your understanding of theory lines up with, when you, with your numeric answers in your problems. This is a, the biggest shortcoming I often face in, in, in fourth year students thinking is that we're very good at getting to this step, but then thinking about our answers is something we haven't been trained to do yet. And um, I, I, I try to make that an important goal of my classes, that we, we start thinking about our answers and thinking about our problems a bit more from an engineering perspective rather than from a purely mathematical perspective. Okay, now I'd like you to t think a, a second, uh, not a second, you probably need a minute or two Please discuss this with the person next to you. This is an important one. How would you even check that Stokes' law applies? What information do you need? Think of it from this perspective. What do you know? What don't you know? What are you assuming? Okay, any suggestions how you might go about this? No? Any groups have an answer or a suggestion of their plan for this? Stokes' law, what does that mean? What's another way of stating that? Reynolds number? Less than one? Okay, so this is just code for saying does Reynolds number less than one. Well, let's put in what Reynolds number is. Reynolds number is V times particle diameter times the density of the fluid divided by the viscosity of the fluid. Okay, so what do we know? What don't we know? Okay, we don't know V, it seems. We know the other pro uh, parts from the problem statement. Well, if we wanted to calculate V, where is that velocity, what velocity are we referring to in that part? Of it? So the velocity of the particle relative to the environment that it's in, right? And so we can calculate that velocity as the terminal settling velocity, it's not really settling in the regular way, 
but we can use that formula and remember we simply replace g with r omega squared. Right? So if we go back to the prior slide there, you can pick out that formula. It's dp squared times the particle density minus the fluid density times r omega squared over 18 mu f. Okay? And if we look at that formula, we know everything now except r. Which r do we use? If we're going to, to verify whether Stokes' law applies, should we use R1 or R2? You want to use the worst possible case. Where, where is that particle going the fastest is at R2. Okay? So we should verify Stokes' law at R2. If it holds at R2, it certainly holds at R1. Okay, so there's, that's that important point there. Again, I'm not... Um, going to insult your intelligence with substituting in numbers here. I'll give you the answer as uh, 0.5 millimeters per second. Half a millimeter every second. That's incredibly slow for that particle to be moving. So it's not surprising then when we substitute in and calculate the Reynolds number that we get a value of 0 0.003 or oh, three zeros, three. Yeah, it's, we could use the largest particle diameter as well then. If we knew what it was, we're not given it. But certainly we should be then going up to the largest particle diameter to calculate the worst case Reynolds number. But if we're at these small Reynolds numbers, we're unlikely to be violating it. Okay? So that's a good check there for Stokes' law. I'd like you to think about number four before tomorrow's class. That's going to be the key uh, lead-in into into tomorrow's topic.